Well, welcome everyone to our March 3rd Covey Lecture. Uh, today we have with us Covey Fellow um, Michael Rittmeister, who's a professor in geography um, here at Brock University. Uh, Mike was born in Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, did his M, uh, sorry, his BA and MA from the University of British Columbia, and then obtained his PhD from Queen's University in Kingston. Uh, you may have uh, come across Mike's most recent book, along with two co-editors from the geography department. They've recently published *The World of Niagara Wine*. Uh, so, uh, oh, yes. a product shot. Copy of the *World of Niagara Wine*. Um, and with that, um, it's a book that offers uh, introductory to Niagara wines here in the region. Um, it's a transdisciplinary overview of the Niagara grape and wine industry with several uh, different themed uh, chapters uh, within the book. Uh, it's a great read, uh, suggested for, uh, for everyone. And it's now available in our bookstore. Yes. Uh, that we just found out too. So, uh, so today he's going to be talking about wine as heritage across Niagara. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Rick Meester. Thank you. Thank you all for, for coming today and thank you for the invitation. Um, it's a, well, there's a couple of, of caveats that I have to run through first. One is I'm, I'm using the remaining tatters of my voice to give you this lecture this afternoon. I lectured this morning in, a, in an undergraduate class and I don't have much left, but I'm gonna go, I'm, I'm going bravely. The second is that this research is done with a friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Russell Johnson, in the Department of Popular Culture, Communication and Film. And he might start off by wondering, you know, what a geographer and somebody in popular culture are doing, thinking about wine. But in all honesty, this research started with a dead soldier. Um, we started off by thinking about the ways in which people, residents, people who live in Niagara, take the mnemonic uh, landscape, the landscape that's supposed to produce memories, and react to it. We know what they're supposed to do, right? We know they're supposed to give us values, they're supposed to give us heroes, they're supposed to give us a collective past. But what we're really interested in is what do people make of it? So we did this research and we got, we talked about a de the dead soldier and his monument, and then we decided to push the, the research a little bit further. And one of the things that we were interested in is if we ask people, what are they gonna come up with? What are gonna be the first things they think of when we mention the word Niagara. So in, in 2005, we started this project and we, we asked people, we said, well, what's the first thing you think of when you think of Niagara? And we talked to about 200 residents of St. Catharines and we were shocked because the answer wasn't the falls, it was wine. So we, we really, this is incredible. So then we started to think about, well, how did this work? Right? How did wine sort of start to become a part of heritage narratives in the Niagara region? So we, this is the sort of outline of the research that we've done, and, and we've published it in a bunch of places. Um, the chapter in here, again, shameless product shot, um, <laughs> describes some of the, the, the work that we did, but there's, there's a bunch of things that I think are important that come out of that research project. One was that for people in St. Catharines, Wine was top of mind when we mentioned the word Niagara, right? So Niagara, wine. Then the falls and tourism. And the kind of things that we were expecting were way down the list. So the War of 1812, Laura Secord, Harriet Tubman, those kinds of things. So one of the things that we started to look at when we tried to explain how this was happening was to set it into context. So one of the things that was happening in Niagara is that, as you all know, we've got sagging economic fortunes, right? The Fordist manufacturing, the big manufacturing plants, particularly GM, were closing down, losing employees. So the blue collar identity of Niagara was, was fading. And there were a couple of things about that. One is that Niagara needed an economic boost. And two, the identity of the region was faltering. So because if you're not working in big factories, how on earth can you be a blue collar town? So we started to look at the ways in which wine was being sold or marketed at the winery level but also at various other levels. Um, and we noted a bunch of things. One is that if you live in St. Catharines, wine is in your eyesight. 
like constantly. You're driving along wine routes, you see signs pointing to wineries, um, you see advertisements, um, you see stuff in the vernacular landscape. For example, like our everyday stuff. So if you're driving out towards Grimsby, there is a subdivision, which I think is called Vineland Estates, I'm not sure. But inside the subdivision, all the streets are named after grape varietals, which I think is pretty cool. So you can live at the corner of Riesling and Cabernet. How bad could that be? Um, also, we noted that people heavily identified with things like the Grape and Wine Festival. And we also noted that um, you know, people would dress up, right? Um, especially their kids for the Pied Piper Parade. And you'd see all these little kids dressed up like bunches of grapes sort of waddling down the street. So there was this level of identity. The wineries also did a good job, or are doing a good job, of connecting themselves to the region's past, and some of them do go back a long way. On their websites you can see, well, our great-great-great-great-grandfather was deeded this land in 1793 and we've been growing grapes on it ever since. So it's a family, small farm business, which is largely what Niagara has always consisted of. However, in that research we also found that there was an ambiguous relationship here that people were able to identify. So they did see grapes and wine as being important, but sometimes, and for some people, the importance was qualified because they were a bit concerned. So one of the things was, as you all are probably aware, early in the 2000s, the grape and wine shifted its emphasis so that it, was more, it became the wine festival rather than the grape and wine. And people were concerned about the way the parade was being done um, so that some of the local um, participants were no longer able to participate. They were concerned about the demise of the event in the tent, which was really about beer um, rather than about wine, but it was an important part of grape and wine um, festivities. And then most recently, uh, the Squeezer Mountain Bike Race was removed from the um, Grape and Wine Festival. Um, as importantly, people started to note that, you know, there's a fence around the grape and wine now. You just can't get in. And you're searched. And how could this be when you're going to a public park? Um, and some of the acts would require a fee to get in. The other thing was that the upscale movement of the grape and wine, or the wine festival as it became known, um, was noted by, by residents so that we had people telling us about you know, how this was now being um, uh, peopled by faux enophiles from Toronto and Ottawa and other big cities. And it really didn't have very much to do with local people. Others were concerned about the transition from tender fruits to grapes, and they were uh, particularly concerned about lack of food security. So if something happens, all we're gonna have is grapes to eat. Is that a good thing? So it's a concern, right? We're talking about a 100-mile diet as being a useful thing, as supporting local agriculture, but how can this be if what we're really concentrating on is grapes? to produce wine, and as one person said, you can't eat wine, you can drink it. Um, and then of course there's the local agricultural traditions. Some people were concerned that local farmers were no longer able to afford to grow crops other than grapes and wine, on, or grapes, on their, their lands, and that table grapes were sort of going into demise and that families were no longer able to afford to keep the land. It would just have to be sold to people from outside the region who would then come and grow grapes and then sell them to make wine. So there was a lot of things that people were telling us that said, yes, we understand grapes and wine is part of our local heritage, but at the same time, we're a little bit worried about this. So that's the context for what I'd like to talk about today. And so one of the questions that came out of a session where I was presenting this work with Russell at one point was, well, you talk to people in St. Catharines. St. Catharines in all kinds of ways is set apart from the rest of the Niagara region for all kinds of reasons. Um, even though we're in a two-tier sort of municipal government here um, and we increasingly talk about the importance of the Niagara region rather than St. Catharines and the rest of it, um, the argument was still that St. Catharines is intrinsically different that it is the largest urban center, it is an urban center rather than a rural town or the countryside, and it's tied in all kinds of ways 
to a different kind of identity. So we said, well, okay, let's try this. Let's try this out and we'll, we'll test it. We'll look, we'll look to see what happens in other parts. So in the fall of, of 2012, um, Russell and I and a bunch of grad students went out across the Niagara Peninsula and we interviewed people using exactly the same questionnaire that we used in St. Catharines so that we would be able to see if the data was comparable and if the same kind of trends were, were um, present. So we basically went into Virgil, Grimsby, uh, below the escarpment, and Port Colborne and Welland above the escarpment, and we stopped people on the street and said, hey, can we ask you some questions about Niagara Heritage? And surprisingly, many of them did. And we got about 40 in each of these towns, and what we did then was to compile the data and see what we can say. The model that we're interested in is an old one, but we found it incredibly useful. It comes from a guy named Roy who was writing in 1998, and he said he was looking at re-energizing rural um, economies. And so he said, look, if you, if you think about the way this works, is that there's an inter usually an interested party, and the interested party notices something that's unique about a place. And they find that to say, wow, this is fantastic, we can market this. But they don't start with the insiders, they start with the outsiders, right? So in Niagara's case, it's marketed to Toronto, Ottawa, Buffalo, Rochester, places like that where people will come and be tourists in Niagara. If it works, and it seemed to, then you turn it around and you start to advertise to insiders. And you hope that once the insiders start to collect and internalize this, that it becomes part of their identity. And therefore, it becomes something authentic. Right? Because one of the things that people who are tourists in, the gra in grape and wine sort of circles are looking for is an authentic experience. And Nick Baxter Moore and Carolyn Chere in the book do a really nice job of looking at wineries and their attempts to make authentic um, atmospheres for their customers. So what we're talking about in a lot of ways is place branding, so the way in which local officials or opinion leaders market local places. And this is becoming increasingly important as different cities like um, St. Catharines, Hamilton, um, Kingston, uh, cities all over Ontario lose their industrial base and start to have to compete for visitors and for tourist dollars and for service dollars and other kinds of economy dollars. So the key here, again, is as Hannah says in 2010, is to not to, dis not to provoke people by choosing something that's different and wacky, but to choose something that they already know. So for example, here she says, you know, you disarm local skepticism by using an authentic place brand, something that gives an area a personality, gives it something that's unique. And by pinpointing that and start putting um, cultural mapping, um, which there's folks around here who do that, they can tell the genuine story, and that's a key word here, along with authenticity, the idea that it's genuine. So that if you immerse, as she said, the brand proposition in the real deal, it reconnects people to their roots, boosts local pride, and engages supporters in re-envisioning their future. So what we're wondering is, did this happen? Or is this happening in Niagara, in the way people are trying to market Niagara as grape and wine country? And we can see that the effort is there. This came from a document produced in 2007, and, um, well, maybe I'll read it because um, I don't know how this will work with the video stuff, but Niagara. The name conjures many diverse images, a majestic falls, a rugged river, surging rock faces, orchards, agricultural hamlets, quaint lakeside villages and bustling urban centers. People the world over visit Niagara every year in vast numbers to experience these remarkable riches. We've got that. Rolling vineyards and fine wines crafted from their bounty are included in these riches and contribute to Niagara's lure as an international destination. So there it is, right? We're taking this and we're adding it to the stuff that makes us unique. The purpose of this study is to develop a strategy to energize to build Niagara's wine country communities. A variety of economic development opportunities have been identified to stimulate investment. A number of community infrastructure improvements have been identified to enhance wine country as a recognizable place and destination. So, and if you follow the document, if you read this document, look at what they're suggesting, a lot of that stuff has already been done. 
So setting up identifiable routes, um, identifying various regions where you, you know, there's the bench, there's the Niagara on the lake, right, which are destinations in and of themselves. But the key here is not so much to devise it as an identity thing or an identity function, but as an economic device, a way to sell the region. More recently, and this is from 2013, the Niagara of, uh, Chamber of Commerce in their blueprint for the economic future says that agriculture is one of the pillars that built Niagara's economy and it continues to be a significant contributor to the overall GDP of the region. So again, it's economic. The growth of Niagara's wine industry and the emergence of value-added agricultural production processes has created more opportunities for growth in this sector. So here again, we're talking about agriculture, and it definitely has been one of the heritage pillars, right? The area has long been known for small family farms. But this is a way that we can use that unique character to sell the region to tourists, for people to come in and see what we've got and consume these small villages and that. Now, one of the things that we found interesting is this is what we found when we asked people, what is top of mind, right? When you first think of, the, when you hear, first hear the word Niagara, what do you think of? So when we've got uh, below the escarpment, it's wine, right? So this is outside of St. Catharines now. This is Grimsby and Virgil. Um, wine is all, more than half in this case, almost half in this case, of the people that we interviewed. But look at what happens when you look at above, uh, below, <laughs> above the escarpment, right? It drops way down. It is not top of mind for the people who are living above the escarpment, particularly in these old industrial cities. What is top of mind for them is something that you shouldn't find surprising at all. It's Niagara Falls. The other thing that's important here is the Welland Canal, right? Um, and nobody on, on this side of the escarpment is thinking about that, right? So location matters, and that's why I'm a geographer, right? Because it does make a difference. But it's important, right? This sets things up for where we're going to go in, the, in how this research plays out. The next thing we asked was, is wine part of your daily routine? Is this how you get? sort of your um, understanding of Niagara's wine region. And what we found was there was really li very little difference between Grimsby, Virgil, and Port Colborne. Um, how do wines and, and wine activities fit into your daily routine? Well, again, Virgil, they're, they're not drinking the wine there. Not at least the people we talked to. But if you look at Grimsby, Port Colborne, Welland, a lot of people are getting their daily experiences or most of their experiences through consuming wine. But again, some of the other things that are important are visibility, right? They're seeing wineries. They're seeing those root markers. They're seeing, and this will become important, advertisements for wine and grapes in, in various things that they're looking at. So what are the similarities? <clears throat> Well, for one, when we ask people how important is agriculture to the region, 95% of people above and below the escarpment were like, absolutely. Wine is or agriculture is incredibly important to the Niagara region. Most of the people we talked to, over 90% above and below the escarpment, participated in some kind of excuse me, agricultural pursuit. So that would be things like fall fairs, going to the market, going to grape and wine, going to a winery. Other, uh, the other important thing here is that is wine part of Niagara's heritage? 93% below the escarpment said yes, 84 above. So despite the top of mind difference, even people who are living above the escarpment who are not thinking about wine initially, they're still thinking that wine belongs somewhere in the heritage narrative of the Niagara region, which I think is really interesting. Then we move into, well, how do you know? Like, where do you get your information about wine? And one of the important things is, again, both below the escarpment and above the escarpment, people are going to wineries. So it's part of that visibility thing, right? You're driving around, let's go to a winery, let's taste some wine, you know, we'll have a pleasant afternoon out. The other thing was word of mouth, right? So people are talking to each other about wineries, they're talking to each other about wine. 
But the newspaper was also very important. People are reading wine columns in the various local papers and the Globe and Mail and the National Post and the Hamilton Spectator, who's ever publishing wine columns, people are reading them. So I think it's really interesting the way people are getting this um, sort of information about what they're talking about or what they're thinking when they're thinking about wine. The title of this slide is from a quotation um, from somebody that we talked to. Food and drink, all I know, comes from that magazine. So we were really interested in the media, right? Because people were talking about the newspaper after going to the wineries and after word of mouth as being a significant um, source of their wine knowledge. So, and again, we looked at it, 84% of people ab uh, below the escarpment, 83% of people above the escarpment, and it really doesn't matter if you get those mixed up because they're almost the same. We're, we're looking at advertisements and getting wine knowledge and thinking about wine because of those advertisements. And if you look at the table, it's a more detailed set of, of data, but that's the summary there. But what is the role of the media in this? What is the sort of theoretical or conceptual framework in, that allows us to understand what the media does in creating heritage or memory narratives? And there's been a surprising amount of literature that's been written on this, looking at the way in which movies reflect um, public memory or the stuff that people know about themselves, um, monuments. But the media, as Lipset says here in 1990, right, so that's, that's a fair while ago, he's writing the media can loosen the bond of local experience and can dislocate local memory. We find that to be incredibly interesting, right? So the media can dislocate local people from the memories of their past, of the collective memory of their past. What's more important, as Landsberg says, writing in 2004, the media can also place memories, can create memories that work at an individual and collective memory. Not for you as an individual, but for you as a member of the re region of Niagara, for somebody who lives here. Right? So if you read the story often enough that wine is part of your heritage, eventually you'll come to believe it. And that's the importance of these people who are writing about media and memory. Right? They, the media can start to create an image for us in which we believe that what they're telling us is actually part of our cultural or local experience. And we believe in Niagara that the media has done exactly that. That the media has fostered this image of Niagara as a wine growing region, no, not only um, recently, but for a ways back. So much so that it's part of our heritage, part of our story. And for Roy, when we talked about how people are going to internalize that message, this looks like they have, right? Because it is a usable past. That manufacturing past is gone. It's not really working that well anymore. It's not really part of our, our narrative because our children aren't going to be doing that, right? Less and less people are being involved in that industry. But wine and grape and wine provides us with a usable past. Yes, we are a wine country. Yes, we have this heritage of being a wine and uh, producing and Oh, wait, grape growing and wine producing region, which we think is really interesting. But there's interesting questions that come out of this. For one, what is the understanding of heritage? What are people saying when they say heritage? And so we looked through all of the response to our, our questionnaires and surveys, and we came up with a number of different re reasons or different answers. <coughs> Excuse me. So for some people, grapes and wine are just an intrinsic part of Niagara. They're here, they always have been. And as one person told us, wineries are here, right? There's not a question, they are here. It's in the soil. And as you all know, I'm sure, um, being viticulture students, we've got fantastic grape growing soil here, right? Um, wine, um, wine, there are wineries everywhere. The environment is perfect for wine. And there's many people who talked along those lines. 
Other people used heritage as a synonym for history, right? So for example, grapes have been here for many years, so of course it is. And then I like this, Vineland, right? It's like it's obvious. If there's a place called Vineland, we must have a heritage of grape growing here, right? It's obvious. Grapes seem everywhere. Then there's lots of connections to personal narratives. So a person told us, I grew up with it. Wine is in my soul. It's a part of my heritage. Another person said, I used to cut grapes when I was a kid. And there were lots of people who, who did this. The whole family worked for farms in the 60s and I had a Harvey farm in the 90s. Other people understood heritage as being part of our cultural activity, something that we do every day. So they said, it seems that wine is part of local heritage. It's local. My family drinks wine every day, as do our friends. It's just part of our culture. There were people that we talked to who just saw wine and the region as being a, an ethnic connection, right? So I was like, well, of course it is. There's lots of Italians here, or there's lots of Polish people here, right? So it must. There's something to do with, with that group and wine. And finally, there's people, or maybe finally, I'm not sure, but local importance was another thing. So wine is one of the things we're known for. So of course it's part of our identity. Something to be proud of, and we deserve to be proud of it because we make great wine. Another person said yes, because, well, look at the number of, the extreme number of wineries. Not only are there a lot of them, but there's an extreme lot of them. Another person said, because it draws people here, so they're looking at the economic side of it. It's one of two things that bring people here, and the other one being Niagara Falls. Ah, there was a seventh one. And then the question is, is it really heritage when we're talking about wine? So one person told us, it's grand what they've done with Ontario wines. Because of the improvements, we've been able to make it part of our identity. I think heritage is a tricky word because it brings up history. But an identity or an identifier is probably more accurate for me. And they're starting to think about the idea that, yeah, we grew wine or grapes and made wine for a long time. You know, and Alan Hughes, again, shameless product. Shot, um, argued about, you know, who, who was the first commercial winery or who had it? Was it Schiller? He would argue that it wasn't. It was somebody else. Um, but that good wine has only been part of Niagara's reality for a very short time, 30 or 40 years. So then that brings up another uh, person's response. What is the length of time we need to make it heritage? It has become prominent and I don't know what that word is, in the last 25 years, but it started well before that, right? So again, so is it prominence or is it time? Just because it here was here, is it heritage? Or is it because it's important that it's heritage? One of the things that we noted, and we found this to be really interesting, was that people recognized that there was a branding effort going on here without being asked. So when we were talking to them, they would just say, yeah, you know, they're promoting this. So we started to look at why or what people thought about this branding. And most people were pretty positive. The ones who noticed it, I think it was 19 out of 26 or 20 out of 26, said it's positive. And both people above the escarpment and below the escarpment saw this wine-based place marketing as being a good thing. So the first reason was that people um, said was the wine industry provides economic and employment benefits in the face of a declining economy. So one person told us the wine is important at a global scale. It's beginning to make a stronger connection between wine and the region. We used to be known for soft fruit, but it is good for marketing and good with tourists. Right? So wine's a positive thing. Why wouldn't we market ourselves as being a great wine producer? Another person told us, I'm very proud of it. It makes you feel good that we recognize it and promote it. VQA and local wine is promoted across Canada, and it is a good product. Other people told us that, why wouldn't we promote it? Because you know what? We need um, local identity. The stuff with manufacturing is going, so why not grape and wine? It seems like a natural. So one person said, I wish more people would realize and appreciate how grape growing and wine have shaped this area, particularly recently. But we still have a long way to go. We need to shake this underdog or lower class image. 
right? So we're th these people are saying, look, you know, we need to sort of bolster what we've got here. Let's grab what we've got and go with it. Labels can be improved on, um, one person told us. Grimsby does not have a lot of wineries or advertising. Highway 8 needs to be more user-friendly and designed better. It could be a new Niagara Parkway. Um, and that kind of route development is part of what that energizing Niagara report from 2007 suggested. That if we can do that, if we can make the region look like a wine producing region, it will become one. And another person told us it's not at the forefront unless it's right in front of you. We need to educate and spark interest um, so that people will participate. People all across the peninsula should embrace it. Right, so here again, why wouldn't we? It's good for us. It's an economic motor where we don't have one. Some people told us that, yeah, you know, it's a poor trade-off for soft fruits, right? Like we had those orchards, they were fantastic. We could have used that, um, cherries, plums, peaches, those kinds of things, but I don't know what's happening, but it's, it's we should have gone the other way. And they just, this is what they told us, I just feel bad that we have to get a ri rid of a lot of fruit and processing plants. It's unfair to the farmers. Seems like wine is the only solution around here for good or bad, right? And there's that ambiguity that I was talking about at the beginning of the talk. And finally, we had a bunch of people who just said most clearly that wine is, or Niagara is just not wine country. Um, so I hope there's no sensitive ears here. With the sensitive eyes, it's too late. Sorry. Um, so one person told us, Bullshit. we want to be a place that we're not. Everything suffers because of it. I know it's BS, so I don't listen to it. It becomes propaganda. And then another person, wine caters to a rich demographic. It's a huge sham. VQA does not mean local. Right? So think about what that person's seeing, right? What, what brings that kind of response? Because let's face it, it's passionate, right? For good or for ill. And then the last person, yes, by extension, people don't drink wine here, which is a bit shocking to read, but this is a region of beer drinkers. It's not part of people's lives like it is in other places. And this is, I thought, was a very interesting thing. <laughs> In Europe, even men drink wine, <laughs> right? But if you think about this, this is a person who exemplifies sort of Niagara's image as, as I've been told from the day I got here, that Niagara is a region of beer and spirit drinkers, not wine. And I didn't believe it, and it's like, always, oh yeah, you know. But here's somebody who's actually telling me that on the street. Right? So when we have to take these kinds of things seriously because, and, and I'll get to the reasons why when I conclude, which is very soon. No, it's now. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> there's a bunch of key points here. First of all, the rebranding exercise, making Niagara known for grapes and wine, seems to be working. Wine is a top of, of mind identifier for the region Above, certainly below, but also above, right? Not as much as the falls, but it's certainly up there. Wine was linked by our participants to heritage narratives, both above and below the escarpment, right? So it's not just St. Catharines, it's the entire Niagara region. So in that case, it's successful, right? Rebranding has worked beautifully. But there's a couple of things that we need to think about. One is, as I just showed you with those passionate responses to the question about whether or not Niagara is a wine region, branding chooses one unique character and goes with that. And what happens more often than not is that character, that characteristic, is important in the region and it is something that makes the region unique. But it doesn't necessarily speak for the character of the entire region. So there's a bunch of people out there who are looking at this, you know, sort of the growth of grape and wine industry, and are saying, that's not me. Why can't we have something that is wider, right? Why does it have to be grapes and wine? Really, it's just for rich outsiders. So the point here is, is that for good or for ill, local life is a lot more complicated than can be expressed through the creation of a place brand. Right? So it has to be done carefully, and I think it has to be done sensitively. What are the long-term consequences? Well, 
Um, a lot of the research that we've done and have, have been doing points to local ambiguity again. So people are proud of the grape and wine industry. They're proud of the fact that great wines are produced here. But they're not that keen on the new wine festival, right? Where's the event in the tent? Where's the squeezer? Um, why is there a fence around the, a public park? How can this be, right? Really, is that for us? Or is it for those people from Toronto who come in for the weekend, bring lots of money, and then go home? The other thing that we're interested in, and this is the next sort of side of this research that we're going to do, is to look at the role of social media. Um, there's one thing to do official kind of place branding, but more and more, I think, people are looking to other means than official sort of, of founts of information to inform their choices. So what happens if people start to put these kinds of things on social media. What does that do for the tourists who are looking and saying, you know, oh, Niagara is not really that authentic. It's about selling wine to rich people where the residents are getting left behind, right? So one of the things, I mean, we don't know how that's going to work out yet, but we're provoked by thinking about this, right? So if you've got tourists who are saying, well, let's, let's go to Niagara. Let's see what the websites say. And they, go through the websites and they, you know, oh, look at that, that's fantastic, nice wineries, nice towns, nice wine route. But then they go, well, let's see what the people who live there really think and start to look on Twitter or start to look on Facebook pages and find a different story. And this is why I think place branding has to be done so carefully, right? Because it's one thing to sell a product, but it's another thing to offend your residents. Anyway, we're stuck there. We haven't started that research yet. And I've taken up about 40 minutes of your time. And that seems like plenty. Thanks very much. Thanks, Mike. So lots of uh, interesting ideas here. Do we have um, some questions from the audience or uh, additional thoughts to put forward? I just wonder if you could speak to the rationale, the decision-making process that went into choosing where you, where you are doing these surveys. I guess more directed that you're excluding Niagara Falls, which is a large population center and also contiguous with all of the tourists area, and that it would seem that that would be where you would want to focus the study on more so than, say, the further outlying areas of the Escarpment. It's a great question. And in part, you've answered it. Um, one of the reasons we didn't want to go there was because we didn't want sort of the pollution of the falls, right? Because if we go to people in Niagara Falls and say, what do you first think of? Um, you know, right over there, right? So um, yeah, exactly. Um, so we were, we were a bit concerned about that. We debated endlessly whether we should do Niagara Falls or not. Um, we chose the other cities that we did because um, we have limited uh, amounts of time in which to do this, obviously. And we would have liked to have done even more rural places. We tried Smithville, but we were there for days and I think collected three surveys. Um, so it's, it's a question of efficiency and also a question of w where we're going to get data. So does Niagara Falls lie in the future? Probably. Probably. But yeah, we wanted two roughly similar sized places um, below the escarpment and two roughly similar sized places above the escarpment to start. Okay, thank you. Yeah? I have a follow up on that. Um, where were you getting your, your subjects? Was it at a farmer's market? Was it at a mall? Was it? No, we stopped them on the street downtown. Okay. So um, it was, and it wasn't necessarily random. We didn't ask anybody who was obviously under 18. Um, we tried to respect people's privacy by not interfering in conversations. Um, we tried not to bother people with little children, but anybody else was pretty much fair game. <laughs> <laughs> yes? You mentioned that just because there's an identity doesn't mean that there's a heritage yet linked to that identity. But with some prominence in time, that can happen. How long do you think that takes? <laughs> 
Oh, that's a good question. Honestly, I don't know. Um, in some senses, it's happening already because people have made that jump in their minds, right? So in a, in a lived sense, for the people who already see grapes and wine as part of Niagara Heritage, it's successful already. Right? Would it have been successful without a place branding exercise? That I can't tell you. But certainly the two seem to line up. It's a good question though. It's very good. Just my own follow up to that, because I, mean, I was going to ask you the same question. How long you know, does an identity need to be before it becomes heritage? Because right. myself, I'm a second generation great girl. My family's been involved in the great, and then eventually wine industry since the 60s. Right. Uh, so for me, it is part of my identity, it's part of my heritage, yep. it's part of my Niagara. Right. It always has been, right. um, you know, with that, but. Uh, I, think, I think the thing is, is, is for people like you who lived it, it's obvious, right? But it's for the people, I think, who live in the towns, right? Whether or not they're making that connection between their own sort of collective past as residents of Niagara and the things that they think of, right? So they're not thinking about, oh yeah, we're a blue collar town. We're thinking, no, it's, it's now, it's grapes and wine, right? Yeah. Do you think the recent rise of our popularity of craft brewers and distilleries popping up in the area will affect our identity? <sighs> That's a good question. It's a very good question. I don't know. I think in all kinds of ways it'll just um, augment it. Right, because you capture two markets then, right? Because there are a lot of people who like craft brews, right? But is it going to sort of spark a counter heritage movement among local beer drinkers? I don't think so. Because I think, again, there's a difference in people who are, you know, the spirit and beer drinkers and the people who are buying only craft beer, right? So it's an interesting question, though. And, you know, again, that's something that we'll be looking at as the research goes on. So as far as I know, there's what, two? The Oost and um, Silver, Silver, yeah, Silversmith. But then we've also got distilleries now, right? There's Dillon's and um, Forty Creek. So we've got sort of craft spirits, too. And I think it may be interesting, too, to see how our identity changes as we move away from strictly manufacturing in the region towards more of a bioeconomy, yeah. which would include grape and malt wine, Absolutely. Include, include the craft you know, industry, but it will also include agriculture, but how it can be used to you know, make, um, uh, grow, grow plants, up, medicinal plants that right. we can extract value-added products <clears throat> from and how that will develop a whole economy around it too. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. And a lot of this stuff is tied to wider economic movements, right? Like the, um, something that fascinates me endlessly is the growth of, of what people call a creative economy. And the Niagara region and the city of St. Catharines have both adopted plans which feature a creative economy model, which is based on making the place not necessarily attractive to firms, but to employees. Right? Especially the footloose creative worker, right? So somebody who's involved in interactive media, um, somebody who's involved in advanced manufacturing, somebody who's involved in um, biohealth or any other sorts of the, the sort of incubator things that are going on in Niagara right now. So part of that is to create a unique experience to attract those workers. And wineries and craft breweries and craft distillers are all fantastic things that will draw people, I think. Um, what can like, brand new wine regions um, do starting um, to increase the likelihood that they will become part of that particular region's New wineries. No, new wine regions. New wine regions. Right. So like Prince Edward County and, yeah. and Norfolk and, and places like that. Probably the same kinds of things. Um, I don't know very much about those other regions, but I know in, in Prince Edward County, part of it is being tied to the, the local history of, of agriculture, right? And local food is a huge part of that. So it's local wine, local food, sort of a local rural experience, 
and you know, Prince Edward County. Yeah, and I think that's part of the way they're branding that place. I know nothing about um, what's going on in southern Ontario, but I suspect it's probably similar. And you know, for Nova Scotia, for right. Slackety Blanc, you know, one yeah. of the signature grapes for the area, um, you know, the name itself relates back to, to the region, even though it was a great uh, bread here in, in Niagara. But it pairs so well with the local um, seafood industry, and so again, that uh, sense of place and mm -hmm. you know, that um, synergy. Yeah. Those things that make a place unique. I did want to make one comment um, uh, for our uh, uh, partners at the um, Niagara Grape and Wine Festival. The overall um, uh, name of the organization is still the Grape and Wine yes. Festival, but they have three festivals within that. And you may, I know your research is a, it's a couple of years uh, uh, since the initial studies were done. But um, part of the initiative of uh, the festival is to get back in touch with the roots. And so the new vintages festival now for the last three years um, is actually held out at a vineyard of the um, great grower of the year, the great king's vineyard, mm -hmm. uh, to bring back that connection of the grapes to the wine and what we're celebrating. So, yeah. um, you know, I think they're also uh, uh, taking some of these um, uh, questions that have been raised, you know, about making that connection back to the local economy, uh, or not the economy, but the local um, agricultural part of the industry and uh, actually doing the festival in the middle of the vineyard. I had one at my vineyard mm -hmm. when I was great king, and uh, it was great. I invited 800 people to my vineyard. <laughs> 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 so, uh, no, you're absolutely right. Absolutely right. Any other questions? Uh, but going back to uh, you know, place branding and uh, as it turns itself into a heritage as it becomes internalized by the local population, um, I wonder if you could just maybe uh, talk about the simplicity then of that place market brand or that um, place branding message that goes up because it seems that the, now we are trying to get more and more localized and talking about sub appellations that the UA works on a lot. And then I guess what you, your, your talk would say that that may be too advanced for what we're doing if we haven't internalized the basic message of great and wide heritage in place. Well, I think there's, there's also a question of scale, right? Um, one of the, re the things that we were looking at was the Niagara region, not particular sub-appellations, right? And I think there are different identities around the peninsula. Um, certainly above the peninsula and below the peninsula are different. Um, certainly Welland and Port Colborne are different than some of the sort of more rural um, places above the escarpment. But I think um, to sell each place would start to create market confusion for one thing. And the other thing is, is internal competition. Um, and, and I'm not sure that either of those things is a good thing, right? So by selling Niagara as a region and then inviting people to discover the different parts of it, right? So you discover the bench, you discover the Niagara on the Lake wines, um, you know, the St. Catharines, three wineries there, right? Um, there was plans for a wine embassy in St. Catharines, which may or may not happen. But so the idea is to sell the region as a whole and then invite people to visit different places based on their own place branding, which is nested. So for example, when St. Catharines puts together a plan for the city, they have to have that plan checked by the region before it can go forward. Right? And every municipality in the region would have to do the same thing so that there's not that sort of internal strife. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, uh, sure. Okay. Well, please join me in thanking Mike for a very <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you all for coming on a Monday during a busy time of term. Uh, just a reminder that our lecture next week uh, is Jim Wilworth, our viticulturist uh, within Covey, and the topic is cold hardiness, current issues, and research developments. So the polar vortex here that we're having, I'm sure we'll have lots to talk about. Thanks, and see you next week. Okay, thank you.